record right now because why not? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we're going. Liam, what's up? Awesome. Hey, man. Hey, uh, that reminded me of when I was doing one with uh, Georgie. I can't remember if it was the one with Danny and Georgie or just Georgie, but Georgie noticed the, the chickens in, in our backyard behind me. And he started yeah. talking about the chickens. So I know what you mean. Like, I, I totally do that too. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed with your background right now. That's where I want to be. Right. Yeah, it was tough. It was like I, had, I have my uh, laptop out here but the Wi-Fi isn't strong enough. So with Zoom, like it gets all pixely if I get too far away. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I'll just use my phone and uh, stream it. Yeah, man. And like you were saying, I did, you know, and then just like another interview. Also, it's kind of a bummer about like the whole podcast world these days is you have, I mean, I feel like all of my favorite podcasts have two hosts. You know what I mean? and they like have a rapport with each other and there's a conversation and then when they bring people on there's two two people looking at the same thing but then the bummer of podcasts is like you'll find one person and of course like ray is the perfect example of not this but like you'll find one person you'll be like damn this guy is like doing really awesome studies. Nobody's asking these questions. Like he's got all these discoveries and something. Um, and like my MO for so long now has just been to like find people who are doing cool work and then always try and listen to every single interview they've ever done. You know what I mean? And I think it's a great way of discovering new podcasts, but it's kind of lame when it's like one guy telling the same story across like, three years of being interviewed on different shows, you know? And I feel like a conversational media is just so much better to like actually explore things as they're coming, you know, rather than being like, oh, this is what I have done. This is what I have to say, you know? It's like, why can't we talk about how our perspective is changing and that be sort of the topic, you know, the, the change that is. I think that is, that, that's so true. And we live in a day and age now I feel like, and even look at our story, like how we met, right? Like, and we'll talk about that maybe in a little bit, but like we live in a day and age where we can literally read a book and think it's the most fascinating thing in the world and then reach out to that person in real time and maybe get an, an email or a message back like that day, either like, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind having a conversation with you. Let's keep this going or hey i'm busy i can't right now or whatever but like we live in a day and age where it's it's i just I get chills thinking about that like and then with ray i think he's particularly special because even in the conversational format we could ask him or i, I i've asked him questions i've heard other interviewers ask him 10 or 20 times and yet the next answer that he has is completely new it's a fresh way of looking at it. It's he's worded it differently. He's maybe experiencing differently at the moment. Like, and I think that's really cool about, about him and Georgie will do this too. Like you're never really getting the same answer because we're evolving and the context is different. Yeah. And I think that's just really also a testament to like how they embody, how they're walking the walk, you know, and it's not even like a try. It's not like they have to have to try, but you know, if like, if we're defining health here as this like youthful, expans expansive uh, state of growing, like state of growth. And of course, like our brains are like the most metabolically active and complex structure in the body. Like, well then shouldn't like all the fruits of our, our thinking reflect that growth and that change? So like, yeah, Ray is 83 and the dude's still cranking out like new ideas, staying abreast of the news and stuff. He's so impressive. I agree. Uh, I even notice that my ideas, and I've, I've heard, I've seen people write about this, like, um, you know, philosophers or, you know, even, even hundreds of years ago, I've seen people write, who wrote about this, but like, I'll notice that when I go for a walk or I'm moving around or doing something that I find stimulating, my thoughts are totally different. So like, yeah. I'll go through this thing where I like, I'll write something like a, like an insight I think I have. 
And if I've been sitting around for a couple hours before I write that, it's a totally different kind of writing. It has a whole different flavor. It has a whole different kind of open openness or lack of openness. And then if I go for a walk, like out in the country, my thoughts are, are, are they're just wider. They're different. And I don't know if you've noticed that. Sure, sure, sure. I've been like geeking out on metacognition for like way, way too long now. Uh, but, but yeah, I, and of course, like just the idea that like what you're eating, what's in your bloodstream, your hormones, you know, and of course the environment like have an impact on your thinking. Uh, I don't think that can be like understated. Of course, it's something that we all like to talk about, but like, you know, just over the past year or so, like playing with all, all the bioenergetic concepts and like introducing a bunch of the hormones and the supplements and stuff, I'm like, okay. So, so I genuinely feel more calm if I'm doing like, you know, like I, I can tell the difference if I'm on, what is it, three milligrams of topical progesterone versus like 18, you know, like, like three milligrams, I'm feeling just all right like it's it's so it's so great like yeah i'm on 18 i'm probably probably not feeling feeling that much it's so anesthetic you know and my yeah. thoughts will just slow down too much but uh yeah it's it's bizarre to me how like the mainstream paradigm of like your mental health is sort of so static just so static anyway man i did uh i wanted to like I don't know. I just had it in my in my mind to write down some questions I thought would be appropriate to ask you. Like, you got your weights in the background and all that. Like, at what point did you start lifting weights and why? Like, what got you into exercise? Yeah, I want to I want to get into that in a minute. But when you said something about progesterone, it just reminded me of my first progesterone experiment story. Um, yeah. And you you mentioned the anesthetic quality of it. Um, yeah. Also, quick side note. Like it's like 108 here in Davis, California right now. And I'm in the garage and I got the garage closed. I just thought it would be a good setup for, for our, our conversation today. And I'm like, it's, it's another little experiment because I'm going to see how hot and sweaty and like, I'm going to see how that has an effect on our, on our conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, but the Pretty first time I experienced progesterone, I think I heard, or I think I read an article that Ray wrote about it. And I thought, I'm going to try this out. My wife had some, um, and so I took a, a bunch. I took like a, a couple big dollops on one of my fingers and then spread it on my gums, and we went for frozen yogurt. And I think it was probably way too much for, for the first time trying it because like you said, like I mentioned to her, like, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes after I applied it, my whole face felt like numb. And like, I could feel like my body getting real, just kind of numbed out and like, it wasn't a bad feeling. It was just really interesting because I, I, you know, I think Ray had mentioned it at some point that that could could happen, and uh, I felt like really calm, almost too calm, and and like kind of giggly, but definitely numb. It was really an interesting first experiment. I think I think it's such a classic story for so many people. It must have been on one of those KMUD interviews, uh, <laughs> where. I guess he had some powder. Of course, we're all using like uh, Progesti or the stuff from Health Natura, but he had pro progesterone powder. And he says he went to give, it was in response to like a pregnenolone question. He's like, yeah, I went to put a teaspoon of pregnenolone powder into my friend's margarita. And it turns out it was progesterone. And I guess it just knocked the guy out. It just like totally knocked him out. <laughs> but yeah, actually, so what uh, progesterone are you using? So um, it started with the progest E, um, whatever uh, is somewhat associated with, with Ray. Um, I, don't, I don't know how much or, or it's that little lab up in Oregon, I think. Um, and then the, uh, the one that my wife is using now that from time to time, maybe every couple of weeks, I'll, I'll, I'll take some, depending. Um, but I think it is the health natura and, and yeah. you, uh, you, you stated that. Yeah. Yeah. They're good. Yeah. Um, all right, man. Yeah. Lifting weights. Yeah. yeah. How'd you get into it? Yeah. I'd love to share that. Uh, 
I, I'm like, it's uh, definitely like in me in some ways. Um, I grew up, uh, my 10 years older brother was like my, he was like my idol. He was like my best friend. He was like my dad. He was like everything. Um, and so when I was like, when I was five, he was 15 and he started getting into um, strength training. He was a big baseball player. I think he still has some records, San Diego County uh, for like home run records and stuff. Like he was a big baseball player and he got into the idea that if he lifted weights uh, and, you know, trained, he could get stronger and better and all that. So I was five years old and I just was watching him, you know, he, I, I, would, I remember doing like squats, like body weight squats in the shower with him uh, when I was five. Uh, he'd do push-ups with me on his back. So these are all like real fond memories for me. And I, and I, I kind of just, I kind of ate that stuff up. I, I heard stories about Herschel Walker and his crazy like training, you know, stuff. I saw a news segment once with Jerry Rice. It was on a, lo a local news channel and it was talking about Rice, I guess, was telling uh, the, the interviewer that his dad uh, was a bricklayer and his dad would throw him bricks to lay and, and Jerry would catch them and then put them on the wall and he'd help his dad at work. You know, he was like, that was his, that, he was an apprentice. That was his first job was just going to work with his dad. Um, and then they had horses. So he would run around trying to, trying to catch the horses. Um, and so I like those things like were real powerful, I think in my mind when I was growing up and I always just kind of like, uh, you know, I, I thought that was really cool. Um, so I got, I got into that kind of stuff at an early age. I read, uh, everything I could, like all the Arnold Schwarzenegger autobiographies. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I had an old, like, uh, I think it was an Atlas magazine and I can't remember who, who it was in, in there, but, uh, uh, I, I just became like, it just became part of my world that I wanted to, you know, go down that, that path. So not to get too, you know, too deep into that, but I just became a gym rat at an early age. And I'd also go off in the morning, you know, before school. Um, and this is at a time in, you know, when none of, none of my friends were doing this kind of thing, but I'd go to a local park with my jump soles uh, and, you know, be, be shooting baskets in my jump soles, or I'd be running overpasses in town that I found. Um, so I just became like, just loved it. Um, so I guess that was kind of the beginning for me. And then I just, you know, it's interesting because now I'm like the anti-gym mentality. Um, so it's definitely been a big evolution um, for me. And there's like my own experience is, is responsible for that, but also like, you know, there's a lot of influences from people I've met, conversations I've had, books I've, you know, come across that have been a part of that. So, so you started lifting weights and going to the gym, like what, in high school? Um, I, the first time, uh, my first like weight room experience, it was in junior high, it was like seventh grade. Um, yeah. There was this like old rackety uh, weight room that was never used. It was a part of like the PE department. And mm -hmm. I, I became friends with one of the uh, PE coaches or the PE teachers. And he, he gave me a key and he'd let me sneak into the locker room and open it up and go work out at lunchtime. So I, I was like sneaking through the locker room and going to, and I was, it was, it was just a big, like one of those big, um, you know, like all, all purpose, like all in one, like gyms that, that was attached to the pulleys and all that. And it was just one of those kinds of things. And it was in like a 10 by 10, 10 room. It would ba barely fit. And I just go in there at lunch and just like lift weights. I thought it was cool. So that was, that was like seventh grade. That was kind of my first dip into the weight room. And so then were you, were you also a personal trainer later on then? Yeah. Uh, I be, I, uh, so I, I played baseball and football at UC Davis and lived in the gym. I kind of joke sometimes that I paid an egregious amount of money for to, to really go to school um, to play sports and, and lift weights and eat burritos and watch right. movies and, and hang out yeah. with people. Um, I, I, you know, so if I were to go back, I wouldn't have spent all that money. I would have just done those things. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, I, after college, I didn't know what I was going to do, but all I ever knew what to do was play sports. So I got into coaching and as I got into coaching, I also became like the, the head strength coach at the high schools that I worked at. Um, so that was my first experience with, uh, you know, strength training. And then from there it became like, I was training like parents, um, young human, like their, their, their kids. Um, the parents would be like, hey, I want you to train my, you know, 10-year-old. 
and his friends. And so then I was training like those groups. I was training the high school age. I was training like the college, you know, athlete when the high school players or high school, um, you know, athletes were going on into college. Um, and I just kind of have been doing it ever since. That's awesome. So, so then that segued into your work with Feldenkrais? Price. Um, yeah, my work with Feldenkrais, I think I, I, I like, and, and I, I, I really want to hear your story too, because it sounds like we're, we're both a part of that idea that what we're getting as far as what fitness is and what, what fitness is being delivered by the mainstream, um, just like education, just like medicine, just like, you know, all these big institutions are, is kind of bastardized and ruining people's health. And so I got into, I got into a lot of that, like, you know, kind of, I, I would just describe it, I guess, briefly as high output endurance related um, strength training. And I just was, was destroying um, my health. Um, I started having a lot of like problems, like um, physiologically, and then just with like my, um, my joints and stuff. I had some like kind of weird, like injury experiences. And I started trying to pick up anything I could to, to help with that. Um, I, I went to the internet and started doing research. And I, I think it was, I came across a guy's website, um, Todd Hargrove. He's got a website, I think it's bettermovement.org. I think his work is fantastic, but he comes more from the neural, uh, neuromuscular or ne neurological kind of perspective um, on improving uh, range of motion and overall health and, and, and everything. And he mentioned Feldenkrais as his influence or one of his influences. And mm -hmm. so then I started looking into Feldenkrais and I, I just couldn't put it down. I, I, I couldn't put his books down. Um, he, he, English wasn't his first language, so his writing isn't always like you know, as coherent as, as, you know, other people I've read, but his ideas were so, especially at the time he was writing, I think were so um, counter, uh, maybe intuitive or, or at least counter to like everything I had thought I learned, you know, up until that point. So Feldenkrais was big. And then I started doing awareness through movement lessons, which are like Feldenkrais's idea, like for improving movement, like one, of, it's like group a group oriented, you, you might be familiar with that, like where, you know, a bunch of people get in a room and it came from Feldenkrais who would basically walk around a room with 20 or 30 or 100 people. Um, I know he did this at Ensalon or at Esalon Institute in the Bay Area. Excellent. Yeah, and, and you yeah. have some, uh, when, when, when we talked, you said you had some, um, you might have some ties to Feldenkrais through some of your uh, influences. Um, and experiences. But anyway, yeah, Feldenkrais, I, I started doing those ATMs and I, I would do a session, which, which typically lasts like an hour long. I'd lay around on the floor and move barely at all. Like you, you, it's really weird. Like you, you lay on the ground and you, and you, you, you spend an hour and, and I, I feel like I didn't do anything at all. Like I would move like that far and, and, and you just move in real subtle, slow, curious. I mean, and it's, it's slow. It's, it's like snail speed, how slow it is. And, um, and I, I'd stand up after one of these sessions thinking I didn't do anything and I would feel it's really hard to describe. Like some of these things were so impactful and powerful. Like I would feel like I, like I was like connected with everything. And I felt like real into my wife and like, like I felt like, you know, just had all this energy and it came from doing almost nothing. Um, I think it was, it was, it was pretty interesting. I did a lot of that. So I did like hundreds of hours of these ATMs over the course of three or four years. Um, so that was part of it. Yeah. I honestly, just to like to put a uh, pin in that uh, moment, that, that sensation you were just describing to come back to you later, but uh, yeah, so that's cool. And so it was like the Feldenkrais method that sort of brought you to the world of al alternative movement. And the idea that we have a lot of bullshit or uh, misinformation in the fitness world. Yeah, bullshit. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It was so. So Feldenkrais was one of them. Um, really, my own experiences. What's that William Blake saying? Like a, the man or woman who persists in in his or her folly is bound to become wise or or whatever. 
Um, yeah. And I think a lot of it was that. Like I was real hard headed, and I still am. I'm I'm still hard headed about things, and and I think sometimes. And I think Ray's even talked about this sometimes, like um, you got to let people do that. And, and I found that, that I might be a person who has to do that a little bit to realize this folly. Um, and so that was part of it. I got into Alan Watts. I, I, I remember reading a book in high school um, about Olympic athletes using uh, visualization and even like Zen um, image, like kind of techniques to, to train for the, for their events in the Olympics. Like, a floor routine gymnasts or uh, rings uh, athletes um, and on and on and on. And, and I got real interested in the whole mental um, kind of, uh, you know, just different techniques. Um, and that eventually led me into Alan Watts and reading his books and listening to his lectures online, which are all over the place. And so I would say, yeah, Feldenkrais, Alan Watts, and then more recently, the last three or four or maybe five years, uh, Ray Pete. And like these guys actually together have been real big in the last five, 10 years for kind of getting me on a whole nother trajectory. I, I feel like at least. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when we, when we talked, uh, we, we, we met through Instagram, right? Basically. Yeah. So like you commented on one of my posts and then we kind of had a little dialogue and then we were, um, whatever that's called, like direct message or whatever. And you mentioned a few things and then we started talking and then I found out that you, um, you mentioned that book, Anatomy Trains um, yeah, by yeah. Tom Myers, which yeah. I've had on my list forever. I want to read, I haven't read it yet. Um, but then you said something about him being somewhat influenced by Moshe Feldenkrais. Yeah. Um, and then we just started talking. Um, what, I mean, what was that like for you? Like just random guy on the internet um, and you guys are like talking now. <laughs> uh i would say it's the sort of seren serendipitous uh interactions that characterize my life you know <laughs> yeah it seems about it seems about right um yeah you know it was i can't really say that i know too much about feldenkrais uh because he like when when was he doing his work it was like a long time ago. 60s and 70s. Well, he started it probably in the 50, you know, 40s, 50s. He worked in the same lab as the Curies. He was actually a physicist, a trained physicist. And he worked hmm. with um, the Curies. Anyway, crazy story. He, he like Ray Pete to me, their, their lives should be a Hollywood movie. For sure. <laughs> um, and I, I keep seeing that in those guys. Um, but anyway, yeah, his, his work was in the, I think, 50s, 60s, 70s. Cool. Yeah. So I, I got to say, I feel like uh, I was just kind of given such a um, jump start, you know, like all the work that I do and like all the thinking that I do, namely the thinking that I do. Uh, I stand on the shoulders of giants, you know what I mean? And so like, basically, I was 13. And I'd been homeschooled all the way from kindergarten and I was still homeschooled at that point. Um, so I was like just sort of doing high school stuff. And I got really curious about like lifting weights. And because my dad had worked as a trainer and managed and run a bunch of gyms, he had collected a bunch of equipment in the basement. And so like he wasn't working as a trainer at that point in time, but we had all this stuff. I had a full gym in my basement. So I wasn't going to school, right? I was homeschooled. And then I'm like getting curious about lifting weights. And my dad was so gentle. He, he like, he, he did not force it on me whatsoever, but he was like, all right, if you want to learn how to lift weights? Like I'm, I'm, I'm here to help. And so it was probably about like four years of him coaching me uh, both personally and like passing on his experience to me as being a trainer. Um, so, and because I was homeschooled, that like would be like two or three hours out of the day. Not that I was lifting weights by any means, but like just educationally, you know, like talking with him, uh, exploring different things with him, uh, picking his brain just on it, 
the experiences that he had had because he he trained like thousands of people like bicyclists and like 80 year olds you know like pro athletes and 80 year olds um and he was the really athletic one i'm like totally not an athlete my dad was all into wrestling and tennis and football all those things but but i guess like the point i would highlight is just that like right from the beginning the methods that my dad was teaching me were already like just totally against the grain and so it was like his influences and the people that he worked with were the people who started nautilus are you familiar with nautilus equipment the only thing i know about nautilus is a story i read in some um either article or book about casey viator and nautilus um getting him to like write sponsor some of their like so, so this this kind of crazy kind of training um, idea through some of their machines, but I, I don't even know if, you know. It was really cool it was like the very first of weightlifting machines. Okay. And it, and it has this, uh, this sort of, I shouldn't say cult of personality, but the guy who started it, Arthur Jones, was just yeah. such a personality in himself. He was like, really bizarre character but he had a mind for machines and joints and he he like got it through his head that like hold on like we can really use machines and and levers to effectively train the musculature of the body like way better than with free weights or like just do living life or anything so his machines have like i don't know I think his son is running, what's, his son is running some uh, machine company right now. Yeah. It's like vaguely similar, uh, hammer strength, hammer strength. Oh yeah. And they're, and they're pretty good machines, but, but basically what came out of uh, Arthur Jones was high intensity training. Now, like you literally yeah. can't say high intensity training now without people just assuming that you mean high intensity interval training which is really which is really bizarre to me right yeah Um, totally different i mean they're just there's different things yeah so so high intensity training was like the bread and butter of my physical education starting at the age of 13. okay and it's really like all about like if not one muscle like sort of one joint um and one set to failure yeah right right because that's because that's what you need to do in order to stimulate the overcompensation response, right? You yeah. put a muscle under load and you ask it to produce force, preferably through its full range of motion, motion against a load that takes about like 50 to 90 seconds in order to reach momentary muscular failure, yeah. right? And then you wait like minimum 48 hours, <laughs> minimum 48 hours. Right. And so like, before you go and do it again. And of course you eat a lot of protein and sleep. And what was it, the Colorado experiment where they put like 30 pounds of muscle on the dude in a month or something. Anyway, um, it's super effective. Like the results are totally there. Yeah. I can't more highly of it as a system for building muscle and like also just increasing like testosterone, structural integrity, like it's all there but it's also really stressful and like i don't think most people are healthy enough to do it you know what i mean so it's it's really a double-edged sword and for me when i was 13 like you're actually invincible when you're 13 it was awesome i i grew so much i gained like 20 pounds of muscle in six months i think when i was 15 once i'd like actually gotten the hang of it it was it was super cool but I didn't even think about doing any personal training until after my dad passed. And at that time, he was working as a financial consultant, but he was still training Tom Myers because small world, I just happened to grow up down the road from where Tom Myers uh, lives and holds a majority of his workshops, right? Yeah. So Tom Myers has uh, this business called Anatomy Trains and he wrote the book Anatomy Trains. And anatomy trains, right? You said? Anatomy, yeah. And so he just needed a trainer. 
yeah. everyone thinks that Tom Meyer is like, I don't know. It, uh, and it, anyway, he needed a trainer. He, he called up my dad. He heard my dad had a background. And so the two Toms, my dad's name was Tom, hit it off. And then Tom sent me this lovely, lovely letter uh, in con giving condolences when my dad passed and, and asked me if I would be interested in being his trainer. And so here I am at 17, and I'm like, uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna, think I'm gonna take this opportunity. And so Tom Myers suddenly became my first client, and I can't speak to, I don't know, it's it would be impossible for me to decide like which was a bigger influence, like my dad's education being passed on to me, or the experience that I had being able to train Tom, you know. Yeah. Hey, hold that, hold that thought. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm fucking so hot in here. I'm going to pop the garage open. And yeah, then totally. Back. Yeah. Uh, immediately that feels totally different. Um, a couple of things I thought about when you were, when you were saying, when you were you t talking there, one, I'm sorry to hear about your dad. Um, can't even imagine. Um, but, but the, the whole, like, um, the, the idea, what well, you made me think about, because, like, um, I think people in the traditional, conventional, educational model sometimes, um, and this might seem like a tangent, but I think it's related, um, it, I think a lot of times they, they get these, these ceilings placed on them, um, that are totally perceptual either by their peers or the whole idea of grade levels or like their teachers or just in the conversations that are happening around them or from their parents. And uh, we're, we're, we're going a totally alternative route with our, our boy. And the idea of it, that development and also opportunities, they have no like, there's no number as far as like age, right? Like when these things should exist. And, and yeah. you mentioned that like your, your whole experience, like you're exposed to some of these things that I would have died to be exposed to when I was 10, 11, 12, 13. And when you're just getting into it with your dad, with your pops, just having a conversation, like he, I mean, that was an apprenticeship, right? Like you're just hanging out with your dad doing work and I would have loved stuff like that. Um, and you got that opportunity because there were no, were no um, perceptual limits placed on you, I feel like. I don't know, that just resonated with me. Totally, man. And you, I can't, you know, say how grateful I am enough, but like, I was reflecting on it last night. It's basically like, when I was, when I was younger, I was so much healthier than I knew, than I am now. And the more I learn now, the more I learn how much healthier I was, you know? And it's like, especially getting into Ray's work these days, I'm like, I don't know if I'm more grateful for that experience with my dad in the gym or just like the decision that my folks made to homeschool me. Yeah. You know, like they did a pretty good job to like get me in touch with other kids. Yeah. To cover that like social base or whatever. But I, uh, but just like the, the idea of teaching kids how to learn then rather rather than like feeding them information yeah um i'm so so grateful to have dodged the educational system in a big way there um so the other question i i had for you was like what at, at what point did you find ray or bioenergetics like where where was the where was the opening in the door there yeah um so the the idea, and I'll kind of string this with something I, you talked about and then bring into the whole like, you know, getting in touch with the race stuff. The idea that like we can do a lot more when we're younger and get away with it. Like um, I got, uh, that really resonates with me. And I think even uh, Kate Deering in her book does a good job that how to heal your metabolism book, which I think is a really good review of a lot of Ray's ideas in more simple terms. Um, but she didn't even talks about it like, and you mentioned it, like if you're healthy, if you're, you know, uh, you know, cellularly uh, at a high, operating at a high level, like you can do a lot as far as fitness and, and you know, exercise and, and such and probably be okay. But to, 
but if you're not healthy and you're not uh, of like, you know, energetically replete you know, status, um, doing things in the fitness, the, the uh, I think conventional fitness uh, sphere are just going to further destroy, right? Any chance at health. Um, yeah. So, and so where I was, was I was getting away with a lot of really extreme, um, I want to kind of say like CrossFit ish type stuff. It was, it was high intensity, you in, in other words, lifting, um, close to a hundred percent of my perceived, you know, um, ability or, 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 you know, maximum and going for very long periods. So it was like high intensity mixed with, um, long, long duration. And I'm glad I, and to hear I, I'm glad I, I, to hear you had, ex sorry, man. What's that? I was just going to say, I'm glad to hear you had experience with CrossFit because it was sort of uh, like something I wanted to get into in just terms of like talking about how we have all these movement systems yeah. um, in, in, in the industry today. But go ahead. You, you were getting to how you found Ray. So you were talking about CrossFit. Yeah, I was probably doing like CrossFit-ish type stuff, like before CrossFit was ever a thing. And I, 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 I became almost like poetic about it. Like I became very romanticized by these trips I would go on. Like I would literally like pack my forerunner, which I still have a 99 Toyota forerunner. And I'd pack the back of the car with an Olympic bar and, and weight plates. And I would take off and I, I didn't know where I was going. You know, I'm in the Northern California area. I either go towards Tahoe or Auburn, like up in the mountains, or I'd go to um, the North coast. And sometimes I'd land in San Francisco. And sometimes I'd land, you know, um, in Jenner, um, California or Mendocino or Lake Tahoe or wherever, but I'd take off and I'd just go, I didn't know where I was going and I'd, I'd land somewhere out in nature. I'd usually find a hill because I love hills and I'd take my weights out of the car and I'd just start lifting weights and running. And like, I, I became like, I, it was like very cool to me to like get out <laughs> and just like go on these adventures. Um, yeah. and sometimes I'd write about it, you know, I'd, I'd, oftentimes I would be, um, totally stoned, you know, I'd smoke, I'd smoke a bunch of weed and then lift a bunch of weights and just run around. And, um, and so where I'm going with that is it was totally fun, but I was getting away with doing things that were probably not good for me in the long run. Um, because I was still, I still had the, some, some of that, um, kind of, you know, some of that youngness, um, still. Um, so I started, uh, I was doing a lot of this for a couple of years, probably from 09 to probably, probably 10 to like 12, like for, for two or three years. I also got, um, into some of the, like the, like no sugar or low carb experiments. And so I was really just, you know, on low fuel doing like crazy, you know, things, um, with, with weights and running and stuff. And I started having weird health symptoms like um like not being able to sleep through the night and it was like actually started to be, be scary for me like i literally couldn't sleep through the night i'd sleep for an hour and i'd wake up with a pounding chest and i felt like i was having a heart attack and i right. and I, I i went months without like being able to sleep more than like a couple hours and then i started having like panic attack episodes so some things were really wrong they were really going like there were some things I think a lot of my friends and people around me thought I was like an epitome of health. And I, I have some old pictures. Like I was so jacked and ripped and I was taking all these weird supplements that I didn't even know what they were from like the back room you could only get into with a key at like a max muscle, like super sore. And, and I was just, I was doing these things. And, um, and I think a lot of people thought I was real healthy and I inside I, and, and, and there was clear evidence for me personally, that like shit was not going right. And, and something, something was not happening, uh, in the direction of, of actual health. So I started, I just, I just dove into trying to, I, I, I basically stopped lifting weights for a while because I just, I, I almost was like falling apart. Um, so I have a story similar to some of these other people I think we've met who go through these like low carb diets and these like extreme fitness kind of things that maybe work for a while or seem like they're working. And then they, they clearly just seem like they're not in the direction of health. And I discovered, um, I don't know what interview it was with Ray Pete, but it was a transcription online from, from some interview. 
and the the Google keyword was panic attacks because I was I was really like I was really curious like why am I having a panic attack like this is not something I had ever you know dealt with or thought that it might be happening to me and he mentioned something about panic attack and blood sugar and hormones and I can't remember exactly but I was like interesting and you know he mentioned sugar and then I started reading and then I got I found I found his website and I started reading his articles. I think this is a this is a common story for people who uh, have been influenced by Ray is like you, you come across this website. I, I read an article. I have no idea what he's talking about because it's just like it, it was just like what so different. It was so um, counter to everything we read about health. And then it's also like deep like he'll have a paragraph. And in that paragraph, I think there's, you know, there's, there's hundreds of hours worth of stuff that you can investigate from a single paragraph that he writes sometimes. And so I went through his website. It took me, you know, I'm still reading through his articles. I haven't read through all of them still. Um, and I started experimenting. The main thing I started doing was adding sugar slowly back into my life. And I also started with the whole, like, trying to um, reduce the amount of polyunsaturated fat in my diet. And I... I guess I would say a couple months in, um, started to feel just so much better about my life and about just the way I felt day to day. And, um, that was all I needed. I needed something like, Oh, wow. Okay. This is something's going on here that just feels better. And I feel like my health now is actually improving. Um, it's a, it's a process. It's never like we get to a certain place where we're healthy and then that's it. Um, right. but, but I, but I, I, I started thinking like, this guy's got a point with some of this stuff. I, I used to be afraid, literally afraid of sugar when I was going yeah. through these sugar experiments. Like I would try yeah. to keep my sugar below five grams a day. Yeah. And oh, I was yeah. terrified that I would eat a popsicle that might have sugar in it. Like I was terrified. And the kind yeah. of like, I mean, that is so um, neurotic. And like the kind of stuff that I was getting into as far as just silly belief systems, um, Ray's work helped me Ray's worth Ray's work along with the, the experiments that I was doing uh, related to his work helped me shatter a lot of those nonsense uh, belief systems. That's awesome. And that kind of gets into uh, the next question that I had thought of, but uh, I think I can do this pretty succinctly. Basically it was like, I, I had gotten myself like, pretty in retrospect like in pretty good shape like metabol metabolically speaking like i was eating all the macronutrients i didn't know much about anything that ray would emphasize these days but like i wasn't i wasn't doing anything too crazy and i had i had like a nice full clientele everything was smooth in my life right and literally like trying i got it in my head that i needed to go on the candida diet okay. right and that was like the beginning of like crash dieting for me and like just so quickly things started falling apart the moment i like i uh, started restricting the energy that was supporting like my business and myself and my own workouts and I would keep on pushing myself, trying to like do more, cut out less, more sugar, right? Do further elimination diets, right? And, and I would just not be getting any of the results. And so I basically just like crashed and burned and had to flounder for a while until I realized that like, all right, maybe I have bigger problems besides like the candida diet. And so I've, I fell into like a dietary limbo for a while until I found the carnivore diet. Yeah. Right. And it was so, it was so appealing because I'm like, oh yeah, this just makes sense. It was such an easy sell because I knew that there were like things that were indigestible. Right. I already like had it through my head that like plants don't want to be eaten, you know? So I'm like, okay, sure. Like eating things that you're made of, that makes sense. Like I can totally dig it. And so I just went right back on the, you know, zero sugar kick 
Yeah. And and things started like like I would just have no energy. No energy at all. I would try and like mow the lawn and picking up my foot like to to get on and off the lawn mower was hard enough. Like let alone pushing the push like just like yeah. crazy crazy symptoms. No libido. Like and I was like 23 or 22 at this time. Yeah. Right? So I'm like clearly I'm doing something wrong. And I would also have just like panic attacks, like you said, like the panic attacks and fatigue. It was panic attacks, fatigue, panic. Yeah. And then I found this guy on Instagram. And I think it was like through an interview with uh, DJ Murakami. Total shout out to that guy. Do you know him? Strong no. Camps is. Dude, I that guy is awesome. It, see, his Instagram handle is Strong Camps. And like, you totally dig him. Uh, he's, he's really awesome. Um, he had this guy on. And this guy started talking about like running on stress and like what it means to run on stress hormones and like how eating sugar when you wake up in the morning is a good way to combat stress. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll give it a try. And it just like, I, I'll never forget the first morning I woke up and in a bit of a cup of coffee, I just did a swig of maple syrup before I started drinking my coffee. And like, I, instantly, I felt like the strength returned to my fingers, yeah. and like my heart like normalized. I'm like, whoa, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep on going here. And I think that was like a year, a year and a half ago now. Um, and it's just been awesome ever since. He, that guy, uh, I think his name is Brian Mintz. He gives a bunch of shout outs to Ray, but uh, it wasn't long before I discovered like. Danny and all the repeat interviews on KMUD on YouTube. I'm pretty sure I've listened to them all at least once now. Um, they're, I got to say, they're so soothing. Listening to that guy talk is so soothing yeah. that like sometimes I will become far, far too calm and like actually get distracted and <laughs> stop paying attention. And I feel that I'm like, shit, okay, I got to go back and find my place. Anyway, man, the question I really wanted to hit you with was like, and looking back, and it could be like at any point in your life, like knowing what you do now, knowing what you know now, like what do you think would be like the the, the most crazy and damaging and, and ludicrous thing that you did or like ate or didn't eat uh, thinking that you were being healthy? Oh, wow. Um. I, I've, I, I've often been laughed at and of course still now, right? Like I, I'm like, you mentioned the maple syrup, like my, our boy and I um, will sometimes go into the, into the fridge and we'll, we'll just turn the maple syrup, you know, over and, yeah. and you know, drain it into our mouth, you know, uh -huh. and he'll do it, you know? Yeah. And, um, so like we've done, and, and, and my wife's used to it now. So she, it's not like a shock to her. Yeah, I still can do some things that shock her, I think. Um, but like, you know, I used to get laughed at all the time for, for the way I would eat. Like you mentioned the carnivore situation. Like when, when I got into the whole like no sugar thing, it was because a friend of mine was like, you, um, so I, I had gained like, I went from like 190. I was like a real thin, you know, kind of athletic looking maybe, but more like an, uh, what is it like an endomorph type build um, through high school and then the beginning of college. Yeah. And, um, and then, so I got it in my head that if I ate everything period everywhere, wherever I could find it. And I was eating like, like probably seven to 12,000 calories a day for a couple years. Like I really, I'd wake up in the morning and crush a tombstone pizza and it was just, it set the tone for the rest of the day. Um, I'd wait. The first thing I'd do is put a tombstone in the oven and crush it. And then, you know, by mid morning, there's like this taqueria, Guadalajara, like my favorite restaurant, you know, in town. And I'd crush a super burrito, which I think was 1200 calories. And that was just my, that was just my first couple hours of being awake. Um, and so like I got in my, my, my head that if I ate everything and if I lived in a weight room, I would get bigger and stronger. I don't know where I got that idea from, but it was just like in my head. And so I did it. And by my junior year, I was 255 pounds at 6'1". And I was a, a bowling ball. 
and I could lift, I could lift the house. Like I was, I was really strong. Like, you know, um, at, at least in my own mind, I was pretty strong. I could, li I could lift heavy weight. And um, my buddy a year later was like, I just graduated from college. And my buddy was like, you know, butter. He's like, you're so strong. He's like, he's like, I bet if you cut out carbs completely, you would get so jacked. Like you would be ripped. And I remember like thinking, and I think it was right around the time that movie Step Brothers came out, or maybe it was, a, maybe that was later, but it, it like the, the, con the context of um, what's his name in that movie, like saying, I haven't had a carb in like two years or something like that. I, I can't remember that scene, but um, anyway, I, I took it as a challenge. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to see if my buddy's right. Like, I'm going to try this. So I went, I went three months. I'd go to like that taqueria place and I'd literally order a $10 side of steak. And I'd just eat steak. I'd wake up in the morning and eat eggs. I, I probably subsisted on eggs and steak for, for, and it started out as an experiment for three months. I started to lose weight and get more kind of like cut looking. And, and then in my mind, I was like, oh, this must be the holy grail. Like, this must be it. I'm going to keep it going. So that led to my troubles or, or many of them, of course. But like, you know, years later, I was still doing it. And I literally would just eat basically steak and eggs. I remember one time in Austin, when I was living in Austin, Texas, I had one of my good buddies, one of my best friends, he came over, over to my house in the morning after we had gotten done throwing some weights around. And we made a breakfast that was, we went to the store on the way home to my apartment that I was living in. And I think we got um, three or four dozen eggs, like, like three or four cartons of eggs. And we cooked all of them. In between the two of us, that was our breakfast. I think I ate like 28 eggs and he ate like, you know, 20 or something like that. But anyway, it was like ridiculous. Like, like what, like what the stress I was putting on my body by doing stuff like that. So I don't know if there's any one, like one example of like, just, just really uh, probably damaging, you know, behavior that I did, but I, I did a lot of like real stupid stuff, I think. That's funny, especially with the eggs. Like I have to one like it's, the first question that comes to my mind is like, what was actually causing you more harm in, in the case of that one huge egg meal, right? Like, was it excess choline causing like cholinergic overload or was it the poofas in all the egg yolks? You know what I mean? Because eggs or, are one of those- Or, or just a, like a, a, an amount of protein that no human will probably ever be able to digest in one Yeah, season. sure, sure. I think the easy one for me, or at least the low hanging fruit of like crazy thought I was being healthy would be the fish oil, man, mm. would be all the fish oil that I would take. I was so convinced that fish oil was the holy grail of making my mitochondria happy. I was so convinced. And so I would spend a bunch of money on boutique uh, omega-3s for DHA in particular, right? Um, and I would always be shopping for a new or new one because you never know when they're going to go rancid. And I never thought once that like, Hmm, if these go rancid at such uh, low temperatures, what do they do inside my body? Never, never considered that. Right. Um, and just all the seafood I would eat, man, all the seafood I would like literally just like try and do like the fattiest tuna at the sushi bar just trying to get as much DHA and, and omega threes as I possibly could. Right. It was wild. And, and yeah. it like did, and there was zero reason for me to think that things were moving in the right direction. That's what really made it crazy. It's like I had, there was no positive feedback coming from my body. And I think that's like, sort of gets at the heart. Danny talks about this a lot is like, you know, eat this way and it will confer health. Like you will be healthy right? And you, you have the same thing with the exercise programs, like yeah. do these exercises and health will be achieved, right? Um, you will possess health. Uh, whereas like monitoring your temperature and pulse, like that's real time feedback of what's actually going on in your body. Like if things are trending in the right direction or not. Um, yeah, it's something that we're missing so, so much. Um, I think, 
I think it, it lends itself to our, and Ray talks about like our author authoritarian culture and sure. our you know, society of learned helplessness and like but this idea that we could like, like um, attach ourselves to a belief blindly and literally not be noticing any cues that something might really be going on. And um, like the fish oil thing, I was laughing pretty hard. I didn't want to laugh too hard to over, you know, do your, the volume of you, but like <laughs> I, I, I would take like 20 fish oil capsules at, at a sitting. Yeah. Like I yeah. remember one time I lived with some buddies at the time and one of my buddies, we were, we were on the couch, like kind of like, you know, flat, not even next to each other, just like across, like watching a movie. And he goes, he goes, butter, you smell like fish oil. I can smell it coming out of your skin. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know if he was like, I think he was being serious, but also he knew I was like, I was, I was finishing these bottles of fish oil that I just bought in like three or four days, these big gigantic bottles of fish. And it's like, I don't even think I went beyond the, someone saying, this is good for you part. Like someone's like, this is good for you. And I like bought it and started eating them. And, and I don't even think I even thought about what it was doing. Um, once it got uh, totally rancid inside my warm uh, temperature body, you know, I, I didn't even think about it. Yeah, and is another case you know, of like, I was doing research, I was like, looking at the hundreds and hundreds of studies on why omega threes are good for you, right? Because there's so many of them. Yeah. And then the, then the problem really is just that like, well, science isn't particularly scientific, you know, and it can't be. And therefore, we need to be that much more critical in how we consume it. You know, like that's a good uh, topic. Just real quick for if we do a subsequent show, that's that. Yeah, I mean, sure. there's a lot of little things uh, that we're saying that might be good subsequent show items. Oh, hold on a second, man. Yeah, no, no worries. Sorry, man. Yep. Well, that was the census guy knocking really loud. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry, man. You were saying about uh, science. Yeah, I'm just like, uh, if, if I watch this again, or if I, I'll put on the whiteboard over there, you know, when we're done, like, just little things that we, that we touch on that might be like good, like future conversations, I'm just thinking. Yeah, man, for sure. And like I was saying in the messages to you on Instagram is like, I think it would be really cool if we could start taking apart like the methods and the perspective and the study design in exercise science. Yeah. Because, because just like we have in the health and diet uh, world, you have people doing studies. They get published in journals, which get read by people who get paid to write articles that then spit out digestible little things for people like eat more fiber or eat, drink this many glasses of water. And it's like, there's a lot of work actually on the consumer of that article. If you want them to like go back and look at like why that's wrong, you know? And that's sort of like the heart of why I'm trying to start a YouTube channel here is just like, making that misinformation uh e easier to see you know and just to like to see like to expose the faults in the collection of information um and the dissemination of the information that get to the consumer that get to the layperson because that's where i think the tragedy is i think so i think to recognize that there's a bias um in um a research uh trial for example, like we have people who are human beings who are subjective, who are, you know, perceiving um, with a history, with all kinds of things that are going into their work. And then maybe they do find something based on, you know, whatever, and maybe they are trying to be objective. And then there's a headline and that headline might get cherry picked 
and then filtered through the media based on a wide variety of factors. Um, and that ultimately there's a lot of money behind um, if science can even happen at all. Um, and I'm talking about the business of science, like real science doesn't need money, but, 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 the, but the science that we see on the, in the articles and on, you know, like the internet and, you know, on and on and on, like that takes a lot of money to make that stuff happen. So I think you're right. I think that that would be amazing if we could really zero in on like, okay, where, where are these ideas coming from? What's the science behind them? Where, 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 where's the research that, that led to these um, assertions? And then, you know, what was going on in that experiment that, uh, you know, and is, is this uh, credible or not? I think that's great. So I think I want to introduce, I, I, I have a sort of categorization here um, that came to me earlier today. Uh, and maybe we can use it in the future even, but like, <clears throat> If you are totally outside the industry, or you didn't go to school for it, you're not a trainer, you don't have any certifications, um, there's all these movement systems, right? And I'm just saying movement systems, but it could be like therapies or institutions or practices, right? Um, and I, I feel like I, I, I kind of came up with four, and maybe you want to uh, edit the Add so like we have like sport based movement systems so like sports themselves for example like baseball you know where you have you the organism interacting with the environment something outside of yourself to accomplish something outside of yourself and you're playing this with other people yeah. right you have like sort of more like solo sports like crossfit right and i only say solo because it's like you're not throwing the barbell to somebody else. Sure, you're competing with other people, but it's all like really externally focused on like what you're doing with the environment, what you're doing with the barbell, what you're doing with the rowing machine, yeah. not what it's doing to you while you try and do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you have all those like sport-based things and like sure you could even toss in something like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, like act just actual sports. Yeah. Um, and then you have like the function based movement systems. And so I think those are sort of where personal trainers kind of get stuck. Um, if, even speaking from personal experience, like, like are you, are you familiar with MoveNet? Yeah, a little bit. Erwin LaCour. Yeah. Er, Erwin LaCour. Dude's awesome. I mean, it like, he's, he's pretty peaty, you know, if I, if I could weigh in. Um, and just like this idea that like we move in our environments naturally just because movement should be a part of life. I think that I don't think anybody in the movement community would get angry at me for identifying it as such. Um, so like just natural movement being like this sort of function based um, or, you know, you have like the, what are those? The P N the neuro muscular can, can and are you familiar with these guys they're, they're the ones who the neuromuscular patterning people i want to say are you are you familiar with that uh no not really if you name some names maybe I, but uh. I, I think i'm i think i'm getting their name wrong um and then for example you have like uh, well, the one that I'm uh, certified with is functional range conditioning. Have you heard of them? They're pretty big out there in California. Oh, so there's there's an awesome movement system, and it's totally uh, like function based, right? So it's basically like you look at the body; it's super reductionist, and I think it's sort of like the best form of reductionist thinking in terms of the body. Like it's a joint by joint approach to musculoskeletal health, right? So it in an assessment, I would look at somebody's like active range of motion, one joint at a time. And in that process, of course, I'm also able to see um, how well differentiated they are. Uh, they use the term disassociation, your ability to move one joint without another. And that's super useful. But I also feel like disassociation, the ability to move one joint without the other one moving, yeah. um, for example, like if you're the one they always use, for example, if you rotate your hip internally, right, does your pelvis 
fall forward. You fall into anterior pelvic tilt when you rotate your hip internally, because if it does, then you don't really have dissociation at that joint, right? So I would make a case that dissociation, joint dissociation, is sort of like a marker, a stand-in for differentiation. Gen like generally speaking, differentiation, like where one part knows what part of the organism it has to be. So you, does your hip know that it needs to be a hip? Do the cells that occupy that space know that they need to function as a hip? Um, and so, so I mean, of course, uh, I'll applaud them because I got the certification. I do think yeah. it's useful. But so that's like sort of what I had in mind for like the function-based uh, systems. And then there's structure-based systems, which you are probably a little bit more familiar with than I, but with my work with Tom, I am familiar with like the idea when you they sort of like the massage therapists, uh, the Alexander method, Feldenkrais. Um, the, if you go to anatomy trained school, uh, you become an anatomy trained structural integrator. So I would say any of those guys, the APSI people would be like uh, a structure based um, movement system person. And so that looks at like, well, like, how's your alignment? If I, if I could put it so succinctly. Um, and then finally, like just aesthetics, just like the idea of like bodybuilding and exercise to change uh, like all this that fall under pursuing aesthetic change. So those were the four uh, categories that I came up with. And I'm totally curious to hear your uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to take a deeper look at, the, at those and like maybe, maybe like even off, you know, cam and like edit them a little bit and like go, go into them. Um, sure, yeah. I, I was telling my wife earlier, I, and I, I only said this intuitively, I had no idea, but it seemed like maybe where we would be a good combo in talking about this stuff is I'm, I've, I've, uh, so much of my life has been about maybe, maybe jumping into something and, and feeling it out and going by feel and, 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 um, and I do have like some, some like, you know, background in like reading various people or like getting into different works and stuff. But I feel like you have, have a stronger background in, um, really digging into some of the research behind some of this stuff. Um, at least at the at the beginning of our relationship, and I feel like that could be a really complimentary um, kind of thing. So, like, I've gravitated towards. I started with the whole like the bodybuilding idea because of the Arnold Schwarzenegger books I got into, but it was like it was like what lifts, you know, what exercises and what body what like body part do they affect, um, and so it's very reductionist, um, and but also aesthetic in the sense that it like. You know, Arnold used to talk about going into the gym and looking in the mirror at himself to decide what he wanted to work on because it yeah. was all about the picture, like a like a like a Greek statue that he was carving into himself, um, and and that was really cool to me to to think about that at a time, um, and then I got into movement patterns, um, so like right. like really I think I've evolved into like this, um, you know I call it six to nine movement patterns. Um, and I say six to nine because I'm always either taking one out or putting one back in and, and, and they're, they're, you know, like the classic, like, like, um, squat movement pattern, the hinge movement pattern. So for example, right, like, like picking something up off the ground is, a, is like a hinge movement. Um, squatting is a transitional movement that finds itself in everything. I feel like, um, push and pull, right. Um, and then I call, I, I, I do like locomotion as a fifth category. But then I have weird categories like spontaneous uh, play and maybe more of that move natural, like, or, or like the sports stuff, right? Like open chains, like you don't know what's going to happen next. Like I love playing hacky sack. So I'll be with someone and we're just like, you never know where the ball's going to go next and how your body's, you know, going to need to be contorted to return that hacky sack back to the other person. And <clears throat> this stuff to me is like, is so playful and so spontaneous. And so I put that in its own category. Um, I put laying. And I, I, I like doing something called corpse pose, where I literally try to lay completely motionless, except for my beating heart and my breathing. And, um, and I play that game. And I call that another category. And I think that, that comes from my Feldenkrais experience, is that the, the stillness and the very, very almost 
imperceptibly slow movement being a category in itself. Um, so I do, I do, you know, kind of, kind of things like that, where I, where I kind of, to me, the movement patterns are like, what movement patterns would I like to employ on a regular basis so that I'm able to do as long as I live things that I would never want to live life without, like sure. bike or sprint up a hill or, you know, lift a box over my head and put it up in the rafters. Um, so for me, like a lot of my thinking is like, I'm going to practice stuff I like but also stuff that I, I see working into a life that I like, a, a, a life that I want to live. Um, so I think together, I think we can piece together some really interesting um, ideas. A hundred percent. And like, I will just go on record. Like it was totally, I mean, it was sort of like function when I was like getting into it when I was like 13, I'm like, I want to be, I want to be like able to like do pull-ups like all the movie stars, you know, and like the action heroes and stuff. But I also wanted to look better. And so like bodybuilding was very foundational for me. And I got totally lost in the whole like functional movement uh, stuff with zero results and like injuries. And um, are you talking like great, like Gray Cook type stuff? And like, I don't, I don't know Gray Cook, but okay. I would say that I would make a case in defense of bodybuilding. Um, is well, it's an art form. Like you totally can change the way you look, and if you want to change the way you look in any given way, like you should be able to do that. And you know, if you think one way is more aesthetically pleasing, then like right on. Like I'm all for the freedom of expression there. Also, like the posing, the posing, and the uh, muscular control, like those are like really powerful. Th those are really, really powerful because it teaches and trains the body to, to trains the mind to live inside the body, right? To experience life inside the contraction in your bicep, to be able to distinguish between whether you're using, you, you know, your uh, VMO or your what's the other quad muscle right and so so i think that's really important um and also it sort of gets back into that concept of dissociation and differentiation just like owning yourself you know like this this physical sovereignty um but but also like you're talking about what you want to be prepared for i think it's interesting how we have exercise because like our lives don't give us any opportunities for movement, right? So we have to go to the gym or we have to create an opportunity and contrive the demand for us to move, you know? And then how do we move? And then how do we think about how we're moving? Like all of these things are so uh, man-made, man you know? It's really bizarre. We're just like kind of accommodating the fact that our lives require so little from us, physically speaking. I've, uh, I've wrestled with that a lot in the last couple of years, especially because if I'm not living my life in a way that is allowing me to do these things, I would never want to lose. And then why am I not? And if I am living my life like that, then why do I need to lift weights to, right. to right? And, and so it's also flip the whole idea of lifting weights for me into something that's like, I, I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm learning to experience it more for its in, inherent qualities. And yeah. maybe that's a little bit of what you touched on, but like, it's, it's so fun to me to pick up something heavy sometimes or yeah. like, um, and, or like, you know, uh, practice a new, you know, or like a get up, right. A get up to me is like a dance with a kettlebell hanging over sure. a big, a heavy load over my head and I have to get up off the ground. Like, like that to me, it's very poetic. And so I, I think I'm learning how to really, really buy into the, the, um, just the, the, the fun that I can have while I'm doing this stuff. And then maybe I blur some of that ridiculousness of like, wait, this is weird. Like, why are we doing this stuff for our, for some like ulterior, you know, and yeah. Yeah, totally. I, yeah, I just love lifting weights myself. I love 
I love exploring new ways to perform an exercise, right? I love exploring moving myself through the environment. And, and I also just love the feeling of like that high metabolism, like your muscles are producing lots of energy against a load that's just challenging enough. You know, there's something, there's something inherently, uh, and I feel healthfully stimulating about that, that I think, you know, like fortunately, we don't need to put our muscles to work like running from danger anymore, right? We don't need to do that. So then why aren't we using that capacity, that physical capacity for fun? Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm totally with you, man. Um, yeah, and then so, I, like, I, I, I also think I just want to add this, like um, it's, we live in like this weird, like, I don't know, it just seems weird. Like we're in this post-apocalyptic kind of like, we're, we're on the verge of some like, I don't know, like just the, the world is like crazy place right now, it seems like. And to know that I have the ability to, to sprint down the street if I need to, <laughs> like sprint, like right now, like I could get up and, and launch myself down the street and for whatever reason, because I might need to. I mean, that's also, I, I don't know, I kind of like that too. Um, so I think the, the, the biggest point that I wanted to uh, make sure I didn't miss, especially in uh, f following up on the like categorization I presented of movement systems and like the perspective road movement. Um, Cause I don't think there's any one that's like D1 by any means. And nor am I about to say that what I'm about to say is the one, but I took time off. I always take time off from like lifting weights or I always change the way that I lift weights or, you know, just change. Most recently I've just been focusing on like, and we were talking about this, like the energy that's producing the movement, right? So if movement is occurring, like what energy systems are producing it? And like, you could look at like, somebody and be like oh well how are they deadlifting in this really mechanistic way of like is it their hips or their back that's doing the work okay yeah but like is their low back doing all the work because their hips exist 24 hours out of the day in such a de-energized like state right that there's no way like those tissues have no uh respiratory apparatus like they've literally lost all their mitochondria so they're incapable of performing uh, anaerobic respiration in the case of weightlifting anaerobic. Um, and so I just think that's like something I really want to talk about uh, a lot is like the energy that produces movement and, and how, how that happens and how like your organs have their own agenda underneath and then all of the things, all of the muscular demands that you're placing on your body happen on top of that as an additional stressor. Like people don't even think about the idea that like holding your head up while you're sitting down requires muscular activity, right? right? Yeah. And it's like, Ray talks about that. He'll be like, there's people with such poor metabolisms that sitting at rest, they are functionally hyperventilating because of lactic acid buildup and all, you know, their broken metabolism. Um, and so like when you realize that most people have like seriously compromised metabolisms yeah. all the time, and then they start like just adding exercise to the mix. I'm just which like, is oh. stress, which is stressful, right? right? Like exercise is, is stressful. Activity is stressful. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's specifically the point I'm making. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, wow. I, I just, I want to say, wow, because that's, I feel like that's going to get me into a deeper place than I had anticipated with this. And I'm, I'm, I'm jacked about that. I'm like, I'm, awesome. I'm, I'm very interested in exploring that. The, the, the thing I thought of a little bit when you talked about the energy systems beneath the action and like what, what's, what's actually giving, giving um, power to the engines that need to work to make that action go. Um, I was thinking about some of my Feldenkrais experience, like 
you know, one of the things he talked about sometimes was when you, when you do a movement, you, you're laying on the ground, right? And you, you might be moving your, your finger. Like you might be laying, you know, out on the ground and then you might be moving, I might be moving my left index finger up, like towards my body, very slow, like, like so, so slow. And then he talks about like, where, where is that initiated? And, and, and you're going inside, you're sensing, you're, you're, you're exploring. And you do this movement where you lift your, you know, left index finger, for example, um, and I just made that up, but you, 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 you do it 20 or 30 or a hundred times and you take lots of breaks and you rest because that's hard work to be that focused and that and to try to really figure out, okay, wh what's actually happening. And then you explore it to a point where you find, maybe you find out that that, that, that movement is initiated nowhere close to your left finger, right? But somewhere else in, in your body or in your hips or in your feet or in your, con and, and, and um, so that's, that's, I don't know, I, I love that idea about thinking about where, where stuff, you know, starts. Um, sure, sure. All the more reason, what you just said is all the more reason that we got to get, uh, we got to get you a copy of Anatomy Trains because it's like, yes, everything is connected in the body. And then, what Tom did so well for the world is gave us a very functional map of how, like how things are all connected in the, in the body, right? And so he does this with the myofascial lines. And there's this, this handful of photos that's getting circulated on the internet um, a whole bunch right now. And they're just called kinetic chains. And I feel like they're getting at it, but it's only like a fraction, like maybe like 10% of the truth that lives in uh, anatomy trains. And it sucks because so many people that I'll talk to, um, you know, they'll come to me with something like, you know, oh, I'm working on my, uh, I'm working on my, my calves are really tight because my low back is all jacked up. Right. And they and they heard somewhere that like you have this kinetic chain that connects your calves and your lower back. And well, yeah, your your calves are intimately connected to the muscles of the lower back. Like I would argue that your calves are more connected to the muscles of the lower back than they are the abdominals. Right. But it just sucks when people when things just kind of get like diluted rather than being digested, you know, it's like, you'll have some, somebody's like really heady work that's tough to wrap your head around, like maybe a Ray article. Right. And Ray does a really good job of making those approachable, but like, then they get digested by somebody, but instead of being digested, they get diluted and it like amounts to somebody thinking that you should just like, drink coke and uh milk all day yeah you know in the yeah. case of ray um but yeah no you should totally we got to get uh anatomy trains going for you um because we can talk about that more i it, it, it is it is interesting right when someone comes and they have these and they, they might be a, a particularly heady person to begin with but they have these um um I, they've identified already what a problem is before there's any exploration of what that problem might actually be. And so it, it makes it almost incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to actually get any investigation going because they've already decided what's wrong. And in a way, right, that also makes it so that they'll never be able to actually explore a different way of being. Um, and I, I, we see this in, in medicine and health, you know, um, matters as well as fitness, but um, I thought that was interesting. You brought that up. I have a question. When um, when you're talking about the myofascial um, connectivity, is yeah. there is there a nervous system uh, component um, to to that work? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I have to like disclaimer like I'm uh, not an anatomy trained structural in integrator. Um, yeah. and if any of them are watching they are so well educated beyond my uh beyond myself um yeah is there a nervous system 
Yes, totally. I think that's the most the most of an answer I can give you. Um, there's there was some other point I was going to make about uh, anatomy trains that's, that I'm losing. Anyway, yeah, I, I I asked that because um, <clears throat> when I started reading Moshe's work, I got open to the whole idea that so much of our our state which is constantly changing. I think he, <clears throat> he, he used the word acture instead of posture because he didn't like yeah. the word posture because it's so static that mm -hmm. really it's, 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 it's dynamic. It's constantly changing. So he, he used the word or, or made up the word acture. Um, mm -hmm. But to describe this like constantly changing state, but um, I had come from a, like a, a year or so of really diving into Kelly Starrett's um, work. And he seems to be coming from a, particularly biomechanical um, perspective. <clears throat> and when I, when I learned more about what Moshe was, was getting at, I realized that there, there were so many people who were missing the boat on the neural, neural um, and the nervous system component of all this. And <clears throat> so that was partly my question because um, like, for example, I had tried for years to like improve the, the depth and the quality of my squat. <laughs> and, and, and I think Kelly Star Kelly Star even has that. Um, I, I don't know if he still does it, but when, when I was watching him, he would say a lot like, "You got to step into the pain cave, right? When you're like digging those things into your muscles and stuff." <clears throat> and uh, and so I I thought like, "Oh man, I need to I need to really get into that tissue to change its actual physical state." And um, with uh, <clears throat> I got into motion, and I, nothing happened. Like I, nothing changed, like I might feel changed for a day, but it would come back where I didn't feel comfortable in a squat. I couldn't squat deep. I certainly couldn't squat like I felt like I could squat when I was a little kid. Um, and then I got into most days work and I, I tried, I, I started doing some of these, uh, you know, uh, these uh, uh, awareness through movement kind of things and started exploring my body in real slow, you, you know, uh, ways. And I, I think I appreciated the nervous system element of it because I would like do these things and didn't feel like I was doing anything. And like a week later, I would, I would like get into a squat position. I would realize like there was some fundamental change that wasn't leaving. Like it was like my body was allowed to access a different way of doing something because I slowed the process down so much and gave it such a clear window of a new route that might be more pleasurable. And it was the opposite of that pain cave thing. And I had real change. And it just, it, a couple experiences like that just blew me away. And that's why I was curious about, I wanna start reading that anatomy train immediately, but I was, I'm curious if he, if he goes into that part. Yeah, you know, it was interesting actually. Um, one time I was talking to Tom and I was just such a mess at the moment. I was like asking him all these questions um because I had been uh I found that anatomy trains as a personal trainer rather than like as a uh massage therapist um as a personal trainer anatomy trains wound up being really fruitful in improving my cueing right so I could give my clients much better cues yeah. because if I could tell, if I could see that maybe the movement wasn't happening in the part of their body that I was hoping that it would, I could get them to like basically pull themselves into a different position that would uh, put one muscle, you know, bias the movement to one muscle or one, one joint. And I thought that was really useful. And so I came to Tom after like a couple months of uh, working with other people and he was like, he basically was just like, yes, and all, but all of that happens around the cranium. And it really took me a while to figure that one out. But like, your brain really is it, you know, like your, your brain is your body. And so, especially like when the brain is well fed and in a higher energy state, um, everything the body does is output to support the brain right to keep the brain uh, like up and so like all of the all of the ways that you might move like support yourself in a squat are all because the brain has them that way 
but I would also something else that came to mind while you were talking there is just like you're talking about the depth of your squat and I think it's super funny because like I remember at first like I couldn't squat at all then I had like a really solid squat and it was effortless and then I found myself able to squat like very very deeply and I'm still able to squat like to like totally like I can just sit up off of the ground no problem right yeah. but I can tell you right now that I am receiving like zero internal feedback from like the muscles deep all the tissues deep in my hip that they are happy producing and absorbing forces in those end ranges of motion right and so I also have to wonder, like, knowing, like, what, like, what stress hormones uh, and estrogen I've been running on, um, like, is this actually just, like, is my capacity to enter that deep of a squat just symptomatic of sort of like a uh, waterlogged, pro prolactinemic uh, state that my tissues can absorb forces down there in, in such depth, you know what I mean? Wow. And so it's like, okay, it's cool that I can do that, I guess. Like, it is, it is functional, yes. But it's also not something I try and do a whole bunch because I'm like, yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't see spending a lot of time in that position as particularly fruitful for me right now. So I might do some more, like, targeted work on the end range of motion for each of my hips and independently and outside of a squat. But anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent. But I'm just trying to, uh, yeah, get into the idea of, that like producing is uh, worth, worth considering. I love that. Um, and it made me think about like, cause I've, I've, the whole squat itself has, cha has changed forms for me over time. Like I used to squat heavy because I thought it was like really important for getting bigger and stronger and like getting faster. And, you know, that's a whole nother research, you know, um, kind of thing is like, is like, um, because I think there might be some research to suggest that if you squat at high intensities, there's a, there's a, there's a, a bridge to being able to run faster or, or it translates to like more power and your, your ability to produce power while you're running. Um, but I started um, last year or so, I started thinking about the squat in, in it related to like life movements and like the, 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 the need to have something real heavy on your back in a squat position to me has kind of, dissipate it's gone away like like I, I keep thinking about all my situations in life where I would actually have to be in a squat position and stand up lifting very heavy weights <laughs> like like the transfer from like the weight room to real life like I, I can't like now deadlifting is totally different right like there's a lot of times in my life where there's a heavy box or um something on the ground a boulder or something I might want to pick up well that's a deadlift that's not a squat and, and so that seems relevant to me, but the whole idea of a squat has, like, I don't lift heavy weights for squats anymore. Like I don't, right. I don't squat heavy. And the, the, the main reason is because I started to really reflect on like squat, the squat as a transitional movement. I think I said that earlier, but like every time we get up and down off the ground, we're essentially using some variation of a squat right in between, or we get up off a chair, right? We're, we're, we're in a squat position coming up. But I'm never doing that with like 300 pounds on my back. Like yeah. it, it, it's a, such a lightweight, um, maybe high volume sometimes, not usually, but like definitely not like what's the need to, uh, and this might be also a tangent, but like what's the need to, to squat heavy? Um, I've, I've lost that as like a, 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 an interest. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that pretty specifically. I think um, basically it's like, yeah, no, you would never really uh, rise from the ground with a heavy burden placed on your back. Um, so, so I, I don't think there's any any need to be doing that. The question of like strengthening the musculature of the back by by loading your legs way up here on your spine. Okay, maybe, but like the deadlift will probably do something very similar if you're trying to yeah. strengthen the muscles of the back. But I I would make a case for like the leg press or the leg extension or the leg curl or any number of leg strengthening exercises right because and and going heavy on them like yeah. sure 
put as much weight as you can on the leg press. And, and it's crazy that the leg press has bastardized me. But um, you want to do that because if you're capable of pushing, and I think we can agree that the squat is a push, uh, if, if you're capable of pushing a weight from 90 degrees hip flexion and 90 degrees knee flexion and uh, what is it, 45 degrees ankle, uh, ankle dorsiflexion, right? You're capable of coming from that like sitting on a regular chair or maybe even a little bit lower, right? And, and pushing a weight away from you that's five times your body weight, right? If you're capable of doing that for 10 reps or 60 seconds, right? Then every time that you go to stand up out of a chair or slowly sit down into a chair is so much easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and your head weighs the same amount, right? So if you get stronger in the gym, it makes life easier. Yeah. And so I, I think that like, there's really a good case to be made for strength, being strong just in that, is that like, you can deconstruct your body and sort of reverse engineer your body with machines, with appropriate strength training to make life a breeze and to also just like make gravity lighter weaker you know and then and then the energetic demands of standing up and out, up and down out of a out of a chair go down climbing up the stairs to go grab something that you forgot is psychologically so much like less of a weight on you and that's a big life thing i like that Like, oh, yeah, anyway. it's, not, it's, not that, it's not that big a deal to be, like, uncomfortable. Like, it's okay to be out of a comfort zone. Like, I remember when, you know, I, you know, it, it resonates on that level. Totally. So, yeah, I guess um, I'm totally into strength training, but I'm examining it from the bioenergetic perspective these days and i think it's uh proving really fruitful i agree i think this 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 could be this could be valuable for other people maybe who are in that boat too of like coming from a background of like fitness or health or you know or just to trying to improve their health or into into lifting weights who uh are also becoming interested in um how how the body physiologically speaking can can uh, operate in a way that actually just like life, life is like a good thing, right? What's that Ray Pete where he's like, he's like, people have been taught to believe that like life is like a, you know, a bad thing um, or, or whatever, but like that life's actually um, a good thing. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. I, I quoted him also on that one. Um, yeah, man, I think this is really awesome. I'm excited to uh, do some follow-ups here with you for sure. We can definitely dive into, uh, I feel like we could have a couple of shows just on, um, we, we could have a couple of shows on a bunch of things, but like just on the, uh, the sport-based or function-based uh, movement systems and like where, where we think they, they come get things right and where, they, where we think they could be improved. Also just to like actually, uh, flesh our experience out against like off of one another I think would probably be really useful for both of us um because you know there's there's more to be learned from the lear what what the other person has learned oh, I think 100 percent like you you mentioned a bunch of things in this chat that I'm like oh I had never even thought of that perspective like I, I want to dive into that a little bit and and think about that and like research and experiment with that so yeah 100 percent. awesome and and i'll try and uh remember some stories of me uh driving out into the wilderness to get really stoned and beat myself up with exercise <laughs> <laughs> awesome yeah man yeah, i feel like that's I all think... part of the deal right <laughs> isn't it though isn't it though all right, man, I'm going to go and try and sneak in a swim here, even though it's dropping into the mid-60s in Maine.
That sounds amazing. Have, have a good uh, swim and enjoy the rest of the, uh, the afternoon and evening. Awesome, man. Take care. It was a pleasure chatting. Total pleasure. Yeah, next time.